Yeah, the music biz business plays this Jedi mind trick on you, where the whole thing's set up to be rapacious and take advantage of your weakness. How so? Well, it's like, um, I, I can, I'll use the music business as an example, and I'm sure there's plenty of parallels across the entertainment spectrum. Um, you, 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 you struggle to get the contract, and then the contract is sort of, you know, the indentured servitude type of thing. We, our first contract was seven albums, essentially 14 years. So I signed that contract when I was 23. That's crazy. Okay, so I'm signing, at 23 years old, I'm signing a contract that's supposed to take me into 37. You're signing a contract for more than half your life. And, and if you look at the shelf life of most artists, it's four to... So they're basically anticipating your entire arc. That's so crazy. So you don't have any leverage, you know, other than that they want to sign you. You sign the deal, and then it becomes this weird dance of like, can I sustain success? Yeah. If you get success and you have leverage, they'll get out of your way because you're making them a lot of money. But the minute you're not making them as much money, then they step in and they start playing these Jedi mind tricks on you. We know what to do. You know, the public's going to forget about you. I mean, I've heard all these things like, you know, this kind of weird like, yeah, you're in the room, but, you know, we're the arbiter of whether you can stay in the room. That's the weird position that record companies had for a long time that they don't seem to have anymore. I would I would argue against that because they, they still do. Well, they've moved to a different set of circumstances, and I'm not as conversant as I, as I once was. But one thing they do with certain younger artists, but I think particularly more in the pop realm, is they do these 360 deals where it's like right. if you get a perfume deal, if you yeah. like your whole world, they we, own you. We own a piece of your whole world. And fame is such a great quotient in American life now that you can see where kids would trade fame and give and be willing to give away like the the, the profit part. Digital deals. Yeah. And yeah. It took a while before people started selling things on iTunes and what have you, but there wasn't really a, a venue for it before that. They would have had to create like they would have had to create it, but they were all the only mm. ones who had the power and the financial resources to do so. You know. Yeah. So and and as a result, now of course they are the only ones making money. I mean, yeah. the companies, the record companies, continue to make vast amounts of money off artists. YouTube makes vast amounts of money off artists, and the artist makes nothing. I, I don't think the general public are fully aware of what a crime spree it is. Crime I mean, it's spree. It's a crime spree. It's a crime spree. But who's who's committing the crimes? Well, they're tiny crimes committed against each artist that that com like compiles a vast library of digital content that through which massive companies, conglomerates, make money from by just sheer mass. But the artist themselves makes, you know, less than a penny a pop. Less than a penny a pop, you know. Don't trust digital. Yeah. You know, in, back in the 60s, they used to say, don't trust anybody over 35. And I think now in the 2000s, it's like, don't trust digital. It's not, it's not reality. It's just mathematics, and mathematics isn't reality. It's, it's a false impression of reality. But for me. young artists, I, I don't know, I despair. It's like, you know, you're, you're hooked up to a record label. The record label makes money by your records getting played on YouTube, for an example. You don't. Not really. I mean, it's like a 0.0375 percentage of a penny that you might get played after about a thousand million plays on YouTube. I mean, it's, it's bizarre. But, you know, it's how it is. What is. What is the justification for a record company at this point? It seems like... What, 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 Distribution. Yeah, but like where are they distributing it? To All what? over the world. But to where? To what, and in what, in what manner? In a variety of different manners. I mean, they now do 360 degrees, so they take a percentage of absolutely everything a band earns, which was not the case before. Generally speaking, they now sew up your publishing, they sew up your performance rights, they sew up your merch, they sh any endorsements you get... You See know, that seems fucked up to me. It is fucked up. Doesn't doesn't seem like it's worth it. Like what do they what do they bring to well, the table? All they are is just a bunch of people stealing money. Except if you're a massive pop star like you're a Beyonce or a Gaga or Kate Perry or a Bieber or what have you, then that company can use its resources to make you even bigger. And that's why these these 
pop stars who continue to make commercial sounding music get bigger and bigger and bigger and more and more powerful until they can just buy their way into the consciousness of the of public culture. All the Sonic Youth records is from from my cursory examination are all available in, on Spotify. You know, you can get access to this stuff. You have no beef with that. Um, I don't really pay attention to it. I mean, I. Um, uh, I don't know. I. I don't know, really. I trust our manager has got us the best deal he could. Honestly, you know? not having an opinion about it is a perfectly good answer. I really don't, you know, I just don't pay attention to it. I just figure we're just not making any money. Right. I, I mean, I just, it's just a gift. I, just my bar it. is You're, set pretty low. Right. And, You're uh, pretty zen about the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. I... Um, Look no further than the deals that the record labels cut with the streaming services. They got into ownership equity deals with the streaming services in an, in, an, in an arrangement for them to have an equity position. They agreed to very low rates for the artist's music. Oh, so that's so when why. So when you listen to Bob Dylan's song on Spotify, Bob Dylan's not getting a lot of money for that. But as Spotify and the other streaming services raise up in their equity position, the labels benefit. So the labels pimped out their own artist to take a greater equity position in a rising business. It's like, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. They, they weaken the artist's position to take a better position at the table themselves. That is fascinating. Reality is here inside your heart. That's why we. That's why we listen to spirit music, and that's why records are good because it's analog. Oh man, it's open and it's alive. Open it up. And Digital culture is not a revolution. It's a, it's a it's a it's this a, is a alive. it's a degradation. It's alive. You can touch it. You can stroke it. It's tactile. You can smell it. What I'm getting at is that it's, it is fascinating to me that the record companies have managed to stay even remotely relevant because like... Well, because they made all these deals with all these new companies. I know, but that's, that's, new media where it companies. Gets, that's where it gets really creepy, right? I think it's creepy. It is creepy. It is creepy. Yeah. As someone who's not in the business, it's creepy because I'm, I'm looking at like what they bring to the table and there's not a lot. Well, but they, they bring, as I said, distribution. And if you don't, uh, I know this firsthand because it's very difficult for us to get to distribute our music because we don't have a distribution label that can compete. Right, but when you say distribution, like distribute it where? Like Everywhere, where is it where? wherever where? they can. But so whether that's ads on the street, whether that's ads on the television, whether it's ads on the radio, whether it's ads on YouTube and so on and so forth. It's just an accumulative con like awareness of an artist. So they're almost manufacturing like public interest. Kind of, yeah. And so a lot of music now sounds like it was made in a computer. It's all solid state, digitally enhanced mid-range. It doesn't, no one sweated. No one loved it enough. The music is unloved. It's like corporate food. No one, the, the guy behind the, 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 in the kitchen at Olive Garden really doesn't care if you love his linguine. He's just order 37 and he hates his job. The guy at Subway doesn't, is not trying to make you the best tuna fish sub you've ever had. He's just trying to get through the freaking day. And that's what a lot of music sounds like to me. It's like unloved corporate music. Where maybe the guys in the band are motivated, but they're getting screwed by the labels and the business of it. Come back, put my name on your t-shirt. Put me on your mail. It's a tough time. And it's tough for the music industry. And you know, I'm an artist that tours. I'm an artist that makes albums. That's it. People don't make albums anymore. They don't make albums. They just try to sell a bunch of little quick singles and they burn out and they put out a new one and they burn out and they put out a new one. People don't even listen to a body of work anymore. We 
our number one. The album debuted at number one! When I first started out, there was no internet people taking pictures of you and putting your personal life or exploiting your personal life as entertainment. I think people are so brainwashed. You get up in the morning, you click on the computer, you see all these pictures and it's uh, all you think of is the picture and the image that you see all day, every day. And you don't see the human form. And I, I think when Nina Simone put out music, you loved her voice. That's what she wanted you to love. That's what, that was her instrument but you didn't get brainwashed by her day-to-day -day life and what her child is wearing and who she's dating and, you know, all the things that really, it's not your business, you know? And it shouldn't influence the way you listen to the voice and the art, but it does. is that my thing is I never blame the artists because right now they're treated as as cattle like mindless children anyway with they might they have no developmental skills because nobody's saying once you have the contract we can't school you on life management you give a fool a million dollars what do you got a fool with a million dollars but you got these cats out here executives once they sign them they know they could get paid more they could go to fucking bel air or their little fucking penthouse and they got nothing to do say yo yo yeah young cat we signed is wild son yo he's, he's wild you signed that motherfucker didn't you
misconception about you, you can clear it up. What, what would that be? What would that be? That I destroyed in Vogue. Oh. Single-handedly, all by myself, I destroyed this <laughs> amazing group that every, the world knew. Um, not at all. There were so many problems within the group dynamic. Two pennies per album started it off. We were only making that much money. It was a joke. It was a joke because we were huge. And so that was it. <laughs> Karen, what her? <laughs> are you serious? Yeah. You are not serious. This industry, girl. This is a mess. You it's have no idea what's really going on behind the scenes. Exactly. And what was worse is that the girls in my group didn't want to fight to make it better. A lot of times people are like scared and they want to stay where they're at because they don't think they can fight the big record company. You know what I mean? So I was the only one saying, hey, this is not right. And I would say if Left Eye was alive and she was in my group with me, we would have had a lot more. Because yes. she, she fought. Yes. She fought. She didn't play. You were the diva that had the beauty and the brains and the business. I just, I just was fearless. Thank you for that. But I had a lot of courage. I just thought, this is so wrong. We're doing all the work and we're, they're making the lion's share of the money. We're working our butts off, but they're making all the profits. So, yeah, I just wanted it to be fair. That's all. We deserved it. Thank you, man. You know, I gave you the chills when you were telling me that. You know, I did my best to try to keep it together, but I couldn't go on, man. I had to step out because you can't, you can't be shackled like that. Nobody can take advantage of another person like that anymore. I did it for too many years, and I held my breath. Red flags kept going on in my books. It's like, really, I'm supposed to make more money? Why am I on the same salary? I'm making the exact same thing I've been making the past two years. And this is back in 2004. So I knew something was up. You know, and I tried my best to work it out with the guys. I brought Tom into the picture. I had Tom in a hotel room with me, talking to my attorney, and my attorney was telling him everything their management company had been doing to them for the past 30 freaking years. And we had... Uh, uh, we had an accountant, a forensic accountant, ready to go in there and look at the stuff. Tom got bought out. Management flipped him over a couple hundred grand, who knows how much, you know, and Carrie as well to keep quiet and go against Lombardo. So they turned their backs on me and when on the last day, here I am spilling my guts here. <laughs> on the last day when I'm at rehearsal with them and I saved it all the way until the end, this was like a few days, I said, guys, we need, to, we need a new business plan. We've been on the same business plan for the past, you guys have been on the same business plan on the, after 30 years. Now I'm an income participant. In other words, I'm, an, I'm a percentage holder. So if, you, if you're a percentage holder, you, know, you have the right, and you're contracted as a percentage holder, you have the right to see where all the expenses are going. Because here you are getting paid off of net, and then what, out of $4.4 million, the band gets $400,000? Where's the $4 million? And that's just 2011. The lawyers. <laughs> lawyers, accountants, and the manager. For the past 30 years, they were doing that to the guys. And they took my information. I'll never forget the day. I said, guys, look at this. This came from your accountant. And it showed all the money. Where, you know, it wasn't showing where the money was going. It was just showing gross, expenses, net. And out of that net, you know, I made on tour in 2011, $67,000. Carrie and, and Tom, uh, that was about $114,000 they, they made on tour. So if you did about 60 shows, divide that up between 60 shows. Anybody have a calculator? No, not 60, let's say about 90 shows <coughs> a year. Uh, 30 in the spring, 30 in the summer, 30 shows in the winter, in the fall. So you break that up per show? Really? It's disgusting. I'm not gonna, I, I bust my ass up there playing drums. I mean, I am just sweating, I'm beat. And for the guy in, in, in the Hollywood Hills, for his facials, his manicures, and his little boys, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna play for that, no. So guys, I did everything I could. All I can say right now, my schedule is open. I can do whatever I want, whenever I want. I can come to Europe, do some clinics, hang out with you guys, do a good point, whatever. Yeah. 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 To be quite honest, I was never a fan of David Bowie. I know that my new partner, Klaus Dinger, was a huge fan. He was very much into David Bowie. But um, I was interested because Brian Eno 
told me that he and David Bowie were listening to our music and talking about the music when Brian Eno visited Harmonia in 1976. And um, maybe it was not a surprise. In must have been summer 77, I got a phone call from uh, one of his staff asking me whether I would be interested in playing on the next album. And I said, basically, yes, wonderful idea. I'd like to talk to David Bowie about that. And then um, next was David Bowie on the phone, I don't know, maybe a day later. And we, we were very enthusiastic, uh, talked about details for a long time, you know, what instruments and... And so it was surprising. I still don't have the explanation, but I have my, my thoughts about what, hap what could have happened because a few days later, a manager called and wanted to talk about contracts and money stuff. And I, that was my real uh, idea, feeling about that uh, situation. I said, don't worry about the money. You know, <laughs> if the music's great, everything will be wonderful and it would have been, but I think that that answer somehow scared the manager. And also, um, knowing, now knowing that um, the sales were dropping drastically in the 70s, David Bowie albums, his change to the Berlin period was not popular at the time with the fans. They really wanted him to be Siggy Stardust and things like that, and so, all in all, I think somebody in his um, in his group management probably took the decision to help Bowie by preventing that uh, collaboration from happening. And um, I got the next call from a secretary or someone just telling me, "Oh, you won't be needed in Berlin. Thank you." <laughs> The other weird thing is, the again, the system I was in was, even if you were successful, it was set up to make you feel like you weren't successful. Right. Because that was the work. That was the manipulation. Yeah. I, I once said to somebody who is a very famous name in the business, um, it's like you guys find a needle in the haystack and then you spend the next 20 years telling them they're not a needle in the haystack. <laughs> right. It's it, it, What I'm trying to say, and I'm not saying it well, is... You would think you would be surrounded by people who are telling you, you're talented, you're special, we want to help you because the more you succeed, we'll succeed and we'll all succeed together. It was the exact opposite. It was like, no, you're dumb, you're wrong, no, you're crazy, don't do that, you're going to ruin it. And then, and even if you'd say, I want to wear this hat, okay, I'm going to wear this hat. And when it wouldn't work, they'd say, see, you should listen to us. Uh. 
Is that universal? Have you heard that I, other, other musicians say the same I thing? I would guess it was universal because looking back, it doesn't feel personal to me. It felt like I, I you know, use your bad analogy, pimp ho. I mm -hmm. don't know. Right. It's a weird con job thing. That was my experience. It was a lot of con jobs. There's only one game. And the game is the worker and the worky, the person that you, you either work or you work for somebody. And if you ain't if you ain't the boss, somebody's pimping you. Somebody is moving you to get their paper, and you got to know that. And the key to being a hoe is just being a good hoe about it, and go ahead and get that money till you can put yourself in that position. But yeah, if you break it down, when a pimp meets a girl, he puts her into a coat and some bathing suit and some pumps makes it look good. When a label meets an artist, they give them a budget. They, they choose them and they say, I think you can make me money. I choose a bitch. I say, I think you can make me some money. You seem to want to. You, the average artist walks into a, a record label who is a pimp and says, please pimp me. Put me out there. I need to be out. What's the first thing an artist say when they come? Put me out there. So you say you want to go on the track. So what I do is I give you money. I make you look good. Now you get out there and you sell me some records. You sell me some pussy. See, there's a parallel. I think it's important to pay attention to business. My, my days in this, in this line of work tell me that I would have been a lot better off had I known something about publishing. If I had known something about uh, record royalties, if I had known something about uh, uh, contracts, if I'd known how to read a contract, if I'd known what I was signing away when I thought it was, isn't this all glamorous? Well, yeah, let's get our picture taken for the trades. Yeah, here we are, signing the contract. But, you know, that contract, you know, is, is the thing that dictates how I get paid for the rest of my life. And uh, uh, I, th I think that that's the thing, if I, if I had, amongst other things to talk about with people that were embarking on a career, in the arts is it's up to you as individuals, you're self-employed to educate yourself about your business because uh, the, the, the alternative is that you end up like many of my contemporaries, which is uh, bitter, broke, destitute. I mean, uh, you know, the, the business side of the arts was not set up for the artists. It was set up for the business people. When, when the publishing industry was conceived, it was set up for the publishers, not to protect the writers, not to make money for writers. It was designed to make money for publishers. And today, and throughout these last 40 years of the music business as we know it, the people that end up with the money are the guys that own record companies, the lawyers, the publishers. Rarely do the artists end up with any money.
how very little Malcolm had to do with it and how much praise he's accepted on his own behalf since. Uh, we wrote the songs, we did all the work, we did the gigs, we led the lifestyle, and he just seemed to have collected the accolades. Which, uh, well, for a certain point as well, he tried to collect the money as well. And I fought that court case and won on everyone's behalf. Now, when the record label turns you out and says, yo, we're going to make you a star, and here's the limo, and here's all the, the, the advantages of being with me, you get turned out. But the artist turns around and says, yo, Warner Brothers loves me. They, they don't love you, they just love the money you can make. Now, a pimp never treats a hoe better than the money she's bringing in. So I don't give a fuck how much they love you, but if you're sitting in that office and Prince walks in, you got to go because Prince makes more money. And they even want you to see that they treat him a little better because they want you to work up to that level of that, that other hoe. You know what I'm saying? Now, the, the, the pimp is going to work you till you burn out busted the dead. And at that point, he going to have him a new hoe because the key to the game is cop and blow. Every time you lose one, you got to catch two. So just because I fell in love with you as a hoe, don't mean I ain't knocked two younger, cuter ones that are ready to take your place. So just as soon as the label says, well, we got you and we love you, don't think there's not more hoes coming through the door. And as soon as you fall off, they're going to put another one right into your place. And then you up for the grim awakening of this pimp did not really love me. And you sitting there crying. Now, the only chance an artist has in this pimp whole game of the record business is realizing that this pimp record label does not love you, that you are a hoe, work like a real good hoe, get the money, take the percentage, and put yourself in the position where you can pimp yourself one day, and then you ain't got to run it like that. So, springtime, 91. We didn't feel much for anyone. We just bashed out some fucking primitive shit playing the instruments, not hitting the instruments, yes. Going for pretty much total misanthropic black metal. Which was really not what Peaceful signed us for, but whatever. Well, we did that fucking Ablaze in Northern Sky album. We pulled... Uh, the bassist in to do the because he's he'd been win uh, with us <coughs> he'd been with us uh, playing bass for uh, the more primitive songs as well so well he could do the what do you call it the session bass for that album he wanted to do it on this flashy motherfucking rack he had we just put him up with some sort of fucking whatever small PV stash with fuss on it we got to play that Pretty intense, we just used a local studio. The studio that um, Mayhem used for uh, the uh, the Death Crush album. Same studio, pretty cool technician we had. And we just bashed it out. That became the more or less brutal, total black metal shit that uh, became A Blaze Northern Sky. After that, Well, we had to send the fucking tape to uh, to Peaceville, and uh, Peaceville said, gave me a call and said, what the fuck is this? And I said, this is fucking black metal, man. And they were like, we signed you up as a fucking death metal band. What the fuck are you doing here? And I was, we got tired of that shit. Look around you, look what death metal has become. It's like nothing, it's like people in... Uh, colored clothing talking about uh, political PC stuff you know for me death metal and for us death metal was always about something extreme and now it's like hey vote, voting or whatever so Basil said we have to remix this motherfucker and I was going like why do I have to remix it and they said like well this doesn't sound like anything like this is just this sound is too weak and I'm going like back like this is what black metal should sound like <coughs> and I said if you don't like it we'll take it down to your own and this fucking label death like silence productions then peaceful said well it definitely won't look good for us 
if a new signed band is gonna leave our label. So okay, we'll release this thing. <laughs> <laughs> so they released a Blaze in Northern Sky as we wanted it to be, and I think no one really regrets that. When I first came to LA in whatever '90 and had the meetings, and you'd be in that you know, that you know hit the office and the people with the beards and everything, yeah. and they'd be like, "So when we put the product out," and every time they would say "product," I would sort of wince. Yeah. Product, like, how can you call my art product? You know what I mean? And that's to them, it's just it's cookies and toilet paper. It's just it's whatever. Ich bin jetzt erwachsen und ich habe viel mehr Power. Ich weiß, wo ich stehe im Leben. Ich, ich bin ein viel, viel tougherer Mensch, als ich das jemals war. Und das wirkt sich auf alles aus, was ich mit dieser Band mache. Und ich glaube, den anderen geht es genauso. Ich glaube, ein wichtiges Faktum ist, wir sind äh, Herren unserer eigenen Musik. Wir haben äh, das Abend selber geschrieben, selber produziert und finanziert und haben es an Century Media lizenziert. Das heißt, wir haben die Rechte dran. Wir haben unseren eigenen Verlag gegründet, respektive unsere eigene Edition bei einem Verlag gegründet. Wir haben die Rechte an dem, was wir jetzt machen. Nicht so wie dem, was wir in den 80er Jahren gemacht haben. Da haben irgendwelche Leute in Anzügen mit Krawatten, die uns noch niemals getroffen haben, die Rechte bis 75 Jahre nach unserem Tod. Und für mich ist das ein sehr, sehr, sehr wichtiger Unterschied. I came up like in the in the early 60s listening to uh, music that I heard on the radio in Detroit and Detroit had pretty uh, broad radio in those days. There was great soul stations, great jazz stations and the pop stations had a different idea about radio than you may have experienced in your time with radio. In those days the idea was, was it a great song? Was it a great record? If it was a great record it would get on the radio and, and you would hear the Rolling Stones and then you'd hear Glenn Campbell and then you'd hear um, uh, Henry Mancini and then you'd hear Motown and then you'd hear The Who and you just heard all kinds of music all day. The, the thing was, was it a great record? <laughs> to borrow your bass for a minute. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a bass, I'll give you a band-aid or something. <laughs> that was, oh, well, one of the biggest disasters, uh, of, not actually of last season, I, I, this is a very hard transition from that explosion, I, I wish you'd bear with me. One of the uh, biggest events uh, of the season last year was a television production of one of America's great modern tragedies. You just saw another one. <laughs> Progressive Rock now had such a loyal male record buying fan base that both the major and independent labels happily signed new bands and let them record whatever they wanted. They weren't even expected to make money at first. This was the age of company investment and artistic freedom. Egg recorded all their albums with zero interference. They 
were interested in us because I think they thought we sounded a bit like the nice who had already had a chart hit and they thought, ah, oh, well, you know, maybe these guys can make us some money. So they signed us up, but we had no input from them at all. They, I don't think we spoke to any Deccan executive ever. I don't, I don't quite know why we got away with it, to be honest, you know, but I, well, that was the, 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 the style then. I mean, we used to just, for some reason, we set the precedent that we'd make an album, when it's finished, we'd hand it over to the record label. I mean, how nice is that? You know, this is the album. We were still allowed to do what we wanted to do by the record companies and management. We were still allowed to come up with ridiculous ideas and then somehow find people who could make it happen. You remember the 60s, you know, that era that a lot of people, you know, have these glorious memories of, which they really weren't that great those years. But one thing that did happen during the 60s was some music of an unusual or experimental nature did get recorded and did get released. Now look at who the executives were in those companies at those times. Not hip young guys. These were cigar chomping old guys who looked at the product that came and said, I don't know. Who knows what it is? Record it, stick it out of itselves, all right. We were better off with those guys than we are now with the supposedly hip young executives, you know, who are making the decisions of what people should see and hear in the marketplace. These, the young guys are more conservative and more dangerous to the art form than the old guys with the cigars ever were. And you know how these young guys got in there? The old guy with a cigar, one day he goes, ah, well, I took a chance. It went out and we sold a few million units. All right, I don't know. I don't know what it is. Well, we got to do more of it. I need some advice. Let's get a hippie in here. So they hire a hippie. They're bringing the guy with the long hair. Now, they're not going to trust him to do anything except carry coffee and bring the mail in and out. He starts in there. He's carried the coffee. Well, we can trust him. He brought the coffee four times on time. Let's give him a real job. Okay, he becomes an A&R man. From there, you know, moving up and up and up, next thing you know, he's got his feet on the desk and he's saying, well, we can't take a chance on this because it's just simply, that's not what the kids really want and I'm, and I know, you know, and they got that attitude. And the day you get rid of that attitude and get back to, who knows, take a chance, you know, that, that entrepreneurial spirit where even if you don't like or understand what the record is that's coming in the door, the person who is in the executive chair may not be the final arbiter of taste of the entire population, you know? Do you like Phil Collins? I've been a big Genesis fan ever since the release of their 1980 album, Duke. Before that, I really didn't understand any of their work. It was too artsy, too intellectual. It was on Duke where uh, Phil Collins' presence became more apparent. I think Invisible Touch is the group's undisputed masterpiece. It's an epic meditation. In the 50s, they figured out how to suck the life out of rock and roll on the one hand, they replace Elvis with Fabian and then also at the same time we'll run out Perry Como on him. This was happening again. Rock and roll was at the time was being co-opted by a political industrial complex of corrupt performers and evil manager owners who were going to create whatever they thought was the best product for them, whether you want it or not. We're gonna, you shove this down your little throats. They rejected their own country and their own people. It's, a, it's cultural treason. There was more American Idol, more of the corny talent show suggested to the American audience at that time than, uh, than people like to admit. It was all, you know. Do -do 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 -do. Marrakesh Express. Would you know we're riding on the Marrakesh Express? I mean, somebody needs to say, you know, some of the biggest peace love acts of the California uh, five years of love um, were created in meetings and stuff 
smells. I say still smells. interest of those days is this is bands who are doing it with primitive equipment compared to now no resources compared to now not any kind of technical or technological ease that you can have now pro tool pitch correction believe me there, there's bands I could mention there's not one real vocal unpitched vocal on their multi-platinum record trust me if the guy really had to do it right now dogs would start howling three three provinces over All I need and so there is a fascination with those times because you listen to the music you go damn you can play that loud and still offend somebody you can play that loud and now I want to get up in the morning so there's a lot of it you know it, it is truly inspired those times were truly inspired and you're, these are people dealing with rudimentary gear next to no budget. And so it was only the innovative ones who kind of really made a, a statement. And this is everything from The Clash to Black Flag, Dead Kennedys, DOA, the great uh, avant scene of New York with Suicide and DNA and Mars and Lydia Lunch and all of those bands. There was a great time in, in music and those records, they hold up marvelously. They do not sound dated. Uh, they really don't. You put them on, you're like, damn, I forgot it was that good. And even just the look, just kind of the homemade clothes and all of that stuff, they, everyone looked great. All the cheekbones and acne and all the attitude, you're like, damn, man, all right. They kind of look like you want to put posters of these people up on your wall like you got Hendrix up there. It's cool like that. Where these days... A lot of the rock bands that are very beautiful photos and they look really well fed and their nails are very nice and their hair is magnificent. <laughs> Take what you have gathered from coincidence The empty-handed painter from your streets Is drawing crazy patterns on your sheets The sky too is falling over you And it's 
all over now, baby blue. Okay. Oh, Christ. That was terrible. I personally don't feel that you're the next American Idol. I don't think you're a very good singer. You don't sing like a human being. Ik, uh, ik voel me niet zo goed voor idols. Nee, sorry lieverd. Vocals, you know, are not strong enough. The, your, your singing just wasn't there. Don't worry about what everyone else thinks. Don't let someone say, like, sorry, you didn't win the song contest. Go home. But on, you know, American Idol, the judges will say, well, look, are you doing somebody a favor by telling them keep going at something they're not good at? Who's to say what they're, uh, who's good or not? Imagine Bob Dylan standing there and singing Blown in the Wind in front of those judges. Sorry, it's a little nasally and a little flat. Next. How, how would you do an American Idol? Oh, I, I would never make it, ever in a heartbeat. People need to appreciate uh, th their voice. I don't want to sing like someone else. I want to sing like me. Number one for Christmas, how would that be? And what would you like to say to the potential buyers listening? This has been a real, completely grassroots campaign started by real fans of music. And I think it's tapped into the silent majority of the people in the UK are tired of being spoon-fed sh one schmaltzy ballad after another, and they want to take back their own charts. And we are honored that they've chosen our song to be the rebel anthem to try to topple the uh, X Factor monopoly. Simon is, uh, is an interesting character who seems to have profited greatly off uh, you know, humiliating people uh, on live television and has a unique position of someone who could not only, uh, you know, uh, capture the attention of, of, of some people on, the, on, on television, but also on the airwaves. So we see this as a, a, a necessary break in, uh, in the chain of that control. Have it. Okay. Okay. Now we gotta talk about it. <laughs> you started talking about the idea of the guitar solo as we have known it, maybe being something that was a little outdated and maybe reintroducing some <clears throat> Riffarama things. But can I say something that I think is bullshit? This what? whole fucking solo out, you know, dates the whole thing. That's so bullshit, you know? If you put a guitar, if you don't put a guitar solo in one of these songs, that dates it to this period. And that, that cements it to a trend that's happening in music right now. I think that's stupid yeah, and I, I think it's I totally trendy. I know that's not what I said. It's always been about like, where could it go? that's kind of new and interesting instead of just repeating something from the past. I'm <laughs> not interested in playing traditional guitar solos anymore, you know. I... Hey everyone, I'm Rebecca and welcome to Watch Mojo. Today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 guitar solos of all time. Hey everyone, I'm Rick Beato. On today's episode, we're gonna talk about what may be the greatest solo of all time. You guys are, know that I'm into hyperbole, but when you see this, you're gonna say, you know what, they may be the greatest solo of all time. So in this video, we're gonna take a look at the greatest guitar solo ever in the history of mankind.
Sound is a, it's a difficult balance between being a creative artist and also looking out after the business interests of being a creative artist? Do I find it difficult? Yes. Sure, sure. It's a challenge because, you know, I'd rather fool with my computer and scroll through some cool sounds, or figure out some new chord changes on my guitar and not read contracts. But if I don't read contracts, I don't get to play with my computer. I mean, that's the way it works. This, everything we do travels on a sea of contracts and paperwork and phone calls and faxes and emails and meetings. I mean, I live in LA, we go to lunch as a way of life. Business is done at lunch. It's, it's, it's how we do everything. I go to enough lunches, then I get to play music. <laughs> I don't go to any lunches, I don't get to play music. Or you don't get to get paid for playing music. That's true, yeah. <laughs> Still get to play it, but yeah. getting paid is the, is the and, idea. No, but that's a good point. If you want to just play music for people, that's a perfectly great reason to want to be a musician. If you enjoy getting up in front of your friends or in your living room or in a club and just playing music for your friends, that's a great, music, great reason to be a musician. That's perfectly fine. The, the problem comes when you think that playing music it, and you achieve success, it's going to deliver you to that good life that you read about in magazines and you see on television. This is a, a lie. This is a lie that we sell in Hollywood, and we mostly sell it to you guys, young people. And it's the lie that says you could be uh, having at the be poolside, and you could have bling, and you could. Uh, you know, drive a, a Denali and, uh, and it doesn't work that way. All your troubles will be gone if you, you know, yes. kind of thing. Mm -mm. Yes, no, it doesn't work that way. If something, if you're, if you're troubled and you think that your solution is going to be found in being an artist and you achieve success, not only will your trouble not be better, you'll be worse. And at a certain point, Along this career arc, the wonderful pain-killing properties of Jack Daniels and heroin show up. Cocaine, ecstasy, they become a good uh, option when reading contracts gets to be a headache and having to deal with people gets to be a headache. And it's a problem that doesn't get talked about much in show business. And I don't know how much you guys talk about it here in school. But it's a problem that I see from my end, and I lived through the course of my life, because at a certain point, the MC5 broke up, like all bands break up. And I had talent, but you know what? Talent isn't enough. I had that talent, and that talent shot me out here, and then one day, there was nothing underneath me. And there were no friends, and there was no support system. And so what else could I do? I got loaded. That's what I, that was my solution. I figured that all, all on my own. Brilliant. I'm brilliant like that. And I'm not dissimilar to a lot of other people that pick careers in the arts. Well, let me just tell you a little about myself. So I'm a 37-year-old guy. Uh -huh. I would consider myself a child of the, of the 90s. Uh -huh. So if I were to have a Mount Rushmore of 90s rock for myself, mm -hmm. it would be Soundgarden, Pearl Jam, it'd be Alice in Chains, it would be who I'm missing. Uh, this is your concept. Stone Temple Pilots. <laughs> okay. And how many of uh, Nirvana? Mm -hmm. How many of those guys on my Mount Rushmore of rock are, are not here anymore? Um, I mean, Lane's gone, Kurt Cobain's gone, and we lost Scott Weiland mm -hmm. two weeks ago. I mean, what are your thoughts on, on that? Does that blow your mind that? Even you're still here, still playing, and, and some guys didn't make it from the 90s? I don't know. I mean, it's hard to say because the, I guess the overall attitude kind of ends up being um, that, that, it's, that it's a drug issue. But, that, but it, that's kind of cloudy. I mean, I have other friends that, that, that were extremely talented musicians that died in other ways. And I think it's just sort of... Well, why did um, some guys make it and some guys didn't make it? Well... Everybody has friends from school that are, that would be the same age as them that aren't there. Mm -hmm. People die, 
people don't survive. Sure. Is it's it a, that kind of is that it simple. simple? Is it a product of their environment, who they hang around? Um, I, I, like, take Scott Wallen for a second. Uh-huh. Okay, so Scott Wallen, known to have a lot of problems for many years. Mm-hmm. Got clean for a while from what everybody heard. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, passed away a couple weeks ago. And his ex-wife had wrote, I don't know if you saw what she wrote, a scathing thing about surrounding himself with bad people. And he's, mm-hmm. you know, kind of propped up on stage every night uh-huh. and never saw his kids and stuff like that. What I'm getting at is, is how does that happen? How does, how does, does, the, does the music industry just swallow people? No, but what I'm getting at is... If you go into a 12-step meeting, any city, and you count 75 people and you ask how many of them are musicians, you're going to get two. Mm -hmm. And everybody else is going to be from every walk of life that you can imagine. Um, The the same as Scott Weiland's mother crying. There are mothers crying who have lost their sons, who are construction workers, mechanics, um, any literally anything you can think of and it's happening every day and the only difference between um, a musician that's famous and that other kid is that um, we don't talk about him on the radio yeah we'd like to take a moment and ask you all to give an incredible roar of applause in memory of the great Chris Cornell an even louder roar of applause to the great Chris Cornell This was our good friend and uh, comrade for years, and we're going to bring up another friend now who is also a very good friend of Chris's uh, to play something for Chris Cornell. Please welcome Serge Tonkin from System of a Down.
there's so much sexism in the music industry. I'm not gonna like sweeten it for anyone. It's it really sucks. It's all about like manipulating younger women with power that like this man has. I had a teacher at school once um, made me audition for a part in my underwear. It's like this isn't a big deal. Like this is just like. Are you a professional actress or not? He gave me a choice, but he totally manipulated the situation so that as a 15 year old, I was like, oh, I want to be serious, and I want to be taken seriously. Music actually generally has is now associated so much with misogyny and sexism. Yeah. How did that happen? Why did that happen? I can't say overall why this has happened. There's a lot of things that I think have contributed to it, but, but I think I was really fortunate that when I came through, it was never about how thin I was. It was about the fact that I'm a singer songwriter. I write my songs, I sing my songs, and therefore I think that kind of gave credibility to me as an artist, whereas it is now, maybe it's always been, and I've just managed to get away with it, about selling your body, sex sells. If you look great and you've got great songs, great, but if you're not quite selling, you can still kind of sell via sex, so, you know, the way you look. And I think that obviously it works, it does so, I'm not gonna disagree with it, but it's never been me and I've been blessed. But there was also a lot of silence around that sexism and misogyny. Oh, I yeah. mean, you know, and like the documentary on R. Kelly. Why is that silence, you think? It's called money. The love of money is the root of all evil. <laughs> and that's just the reality of it. You know, people saw R. Kelly as a cash cow and they didn't want to give up the cash. So they ignored what was going on. And he's not the first and he won't be the last. Whenever there's money involved and people are greedy and they want to make money, and they can they learn to look the other way on a lot of things. So bad. Come sneaking around, trying to drive me mad. Busting in on my dreams, making me see things I don't want to see. So for a random example, you can turn up at an airport, you've flown from LA to London, you, you arrive and there's a limousine waiting for you and you don't even question it. You're like, oh, this is the Transpo, the record company I've sent. They take you to this ridiculous hotel, that, the posher than you've ever been in your life. You don't think about it because the record company's paying for it. <clears throat> they throw a huge big party. Wow, how generous our record company is so amazing. Well, look at this incredible party. And then they're charging you for it. They're charging you for every <clears throat> single thing, and yet none of it gets run through you for your approval. So right. you have no power over the economic spending, but you get charged back absolutely every single expenditure. Not only that, the salaries of the people that run these yeah. companies, all that is dependent and upon then, you selling your art. That's right. And it, when things are going well, everyone's there going, Weren't, didn't we do an amazing job? You know, worship me. You know, literally every one of the record companies really? like you, you, you owe us a thank you, and aren't we amazing? And Is that then, how they talk to you? No, but the, it's an inference. Like, oh, yeah, I did that. We did this. Look at how, what a great job we did for you and your band. And you're like, yeah, great, thank you so much. That is wonderful. And then the second something goes wrong, is you're on your own. You guys need to figure this out. We're just your record label. We can't. You know, wow. I mean, it's just like it's 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 difficult to deal with at first, but then you get used to it. <laughs> Come on, guys. Yo, wait, one more second. One second. We got water on the stage in the front. Can I get a towel? Uh, Christina, let me just get your, your thing around your waist. You don't need that. How you guys feeling? Doing all right? All right. I just need you guys to get warmed up so I can get... Hey, no, what are you doing? Yo, 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 what are you doing? Stop it. Come on. I said stop it. Yo, what are you doing? 
come on. Guys, yo, listen to me. Are you listening? Okay, I'm trying to wipe the floor. Give me a second, yo. Guys, never mind. I'm, I'm done. I'm not doing the show. I'm not doing the show. It's not only just for the audience's sake that, that we try to like, talk with them and confront them, it's for our sake. We don't want to feel like we're just playing to a bunch of, you know, like heads, you know, like, okay, there's some heads and some bodies out there, you know, and let's play and go home, you know. We want, because it's not worthwhile to me to be playing just to heads and bodies, because heads and bodies represent just consumers. And I don't want to have nothing to do with that. If they're there to be, you know, if I, I want to go play to people, and those people are there with me, and not like, and that way, if we can get into a thing where we respect each other as human beings, and the chances are that, you know, we're going to be taking care of each other in a little better sense and just, you know, people can re recognize the fact that, hey, he's a human being, I'm a human being, and everything's swell, or whatever, or whatever, and then we can take it out in the streets from there, you know, but that's, but if it's just a thing where they come and play their, pay their money, and there we are up there, and we're out here, that was a good show, let's go home, don't make no difference, you know, that's bullshit. Who's my youngest fan? Who's the youngest person out there? How old are you? How old is you? How old? 17 years old. How do you? You look better. 14. Let me go talk to this 14 year old girl. Fuck you. On some SVU shit right now. 14. You could be at a fucking Justin Bieber concert right now. Your front row at body count. Make some noise for the 14 year old lady. Guess what? No one will ever fuck with you again, cause guess what? Today, you got an Uncle Ice T. I'm your motherfucking uncle now, sweetheart. And if any guy, any girl ever fucks with you, you look him dead in the face and you say, Talk shit, get shot. Talk shit! circle pit going there. That was very nice. Thank you very much. But you know, it is a metal festival and we're a bunch of emotionally, well at least I am, an emotionally repressed human being. And I'm here playing heavy music because it makes me feel good. But I'm also 40 fucking two. Jesus Christ. Kids and fucking everybody's cancer and all that shit. So let's do a favor, right? 
Vakin, let's have a huge group hug. Come on, not a circle pit, group hug. Come on, everybody. You see that? Look at that. It's a wall of uh, dude, apparently. Look at that. Man, you think it was awkward before. Check that shit out. Look at that. The guy in the middle there has got a boner like you wouldn't believe. Look at these guys hugging. My friends, we're lucky to be here. Grace to you. This is the last so-called song that I am going to scream at you during my trip to your fucking beautiful country. Thanks for fucking having us. And thanks for listening to us. And thanks for being for real, you fucking good, healthy people. I think instead of start the song right now, I'll just do a fucking stage dive. Fuck.
and bleed, baby. When you become a, a, a hugely successful musician and your life becomes touring, big arenas, doing radio shows, getting on the bus, getting on the plane, all this stuff, does it make it difficult to have like the time or the, the actual experiences to continue to create? Yes. Because you get so deoxygenated in the bubble that you start writing songs about being on tour. Yeah, like comedians will tell jokes about airline food. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. You end up becoming sort of like, you're trying to take people in the insularity of your experience, but it's not that interesting. Right. It, and at some point it becomes unrelatable. Well, I always said that about, like, uh, I mean, there's there's a lot of bands, but some of the great Allman Brothers or Leonard Skinner like they had a bunch of songs about leaving about getting away from women you know lord i was born <laughs> a rambling so. man rightly I mean, so yeah <laughs> there was so many songs about just getting away from women yeah the other day you know? i heard that crosby stills nash and song and it's like just a song before i go it's all about he's going on tour and they yeah. go to the airport and it's uncomfortable it's like it's such a going on tour song yeah but it's like it's really not that relatable to most people no to a lot of people it's not yeah i mean skinner had a shitload of those they, they really did have a, quite a few songs about like getting the fuck out of dodge but they were good. Oh, dude. <laughs> Such a, giant, a great band. Giant fan. I mean, they're probably the greatest thing to ever come out of Florida. It's arguable, you know? I'm trying to think who else came out of Florida. deal with the corrupt side of the music business people I have to deal with and every other band out there has to deal with um, that makes it very very difficult to continue doing what we're doing I've overcome a lot of odds and uh, I'm happy to still be here and uh, the people out there that hurt the bands financially and as people those are the people that that in the end get shown for what they are a lot of the new lyrics reflect that what comes around goes around type of attitude. You know, I am set in my ways. I'm going to continue doing what I do. It's what I enjoy and what I know best, you know, how to do. If I didn't do this, I don't know what I'd do. Maybe I'd be a cook. I like cooking. <laughs> you know, that's pretty limited. So, uh, I, you know, I plan on continue, continuing to do this and putting the lyrics uh, in the direction of, of reality. You know, like I said, the new lyrics are dealing with the corrupt side of the music business and stuff like that. Okay, well, being like one of the leading bands of death metal, and a lot of people might have a different image of you than you would want them to see, what kind of person is Chuck Schulman of that? I mean, I call you once a while on YouTube, you know, you mow you on, or right. whatever. So, very, <laughs> very down to earth, uh, family uh, oriented. Uh, home type person you know I like doing simple things I like going to the beach having a good time barbecuing you know playing with our cats and dogs you know things that everyone pretty much enjoys doing you know I enjoy a very normal lifestyle um, it's nothing outrageous no wild parties I'm pretty mellow and you know it's just I like staying apart 
staying a part of the normal side of life, and that's what it is to me, normal things, you know, uh, doing things with my friends and family, and just being a normal person, because the, the music business is not normal, and you need a break, and you have got to separate the two, because there's a point in my life where they were getting mixed, and it's, it's not a good thing, you know, it's not a good thing at all to mix, uh, to get the your anger and against the business evolves into your life you know you really have to keep them separate and it's hard to at times i think music is alive and well doing really great for a lot of reasons one of the which is the internet and so many bands who do not hold up fm radio clear channel or mtv or music plus or whatever you all have going here they hold none of that in any esteem whatsoever I buy records from bands on a regular basis. They only make CDRs. They can't be bothered. They're like, we're only making 25 of this one. And that, well, what happens when the 25 is over? Borrow it and copy it, put it on the internet, give it away. We're making another record. And a lot of those noise bands, like, you know, we made a cassette. You have to borrow it from him. That's the new album, that's the new album. It's at his house. I, mean, I love that. We're doing a tour of basements. We're playing basement parties. That's our whole national tour. We're like, hey, don't you want to be in this magazine? No. Are you kidding? Be in Rolling Stone? How lame. Like, they're running away from that. And which is giving the major labels worry, iTunes worry, FM worry, and let them be stuck with their nickelbacks and their rascal flats. Fuck, you can have them. Look at this photograph. <laughs> Basically, you asked me what I think of, of music today. I think, I think that what's happening in popular music today is the end result of um, music that's uh, been cultivated by uh, record company executives with uh, no artistic content whatsoever. I mean, I'm, what I'm saying is these executives are only looking to sell pieces of plastic. And it's, it, the, so, so it's ended up creating a generation of artists that aren't trying to tell you a story that's original. They're not, they're not I don't hear anyone playing anything or saying anything or singing anything that I haven't heard before better. Um, and and I, so I hold the artist responsible for that to a large degree, but I also hold the culture around the artist that creates that in the terms of, you know, you have to go to the gatekeepers, you've got to go to the record companies, and if the record companies want you to sound like Britney Spears or Death or Megadeth or whoever they're selling that week, then everybody's gonna try to sound like that. It's like the difference between, uh, there was a day when a, when a record promo man would come into the radio station, he'd say, have I got a record for you? You've never heard anything like this before in your life. This is gonna slay you. And he'd put the record on and they go, oh yeah, yeah. And then today, if the same guy came in, he'd say, I got a record for you. It sounds just like everything you're listening to. <laughs> you see what I mean? So, so they're not cultivating originality. They're not, they're, they're not looking for the original. There are original artists out there, absolutely. I mean, Anthony and the Johnsons, there's dozens and dozens and dozens of, of, of unique artists out there, talented people, but the, you gotta look for them, you gotta find them, you gotta get on the internets, and, and you gotta dig deep, you know.
of the great things about the internet. You know, if I'm interested in Czechoslovakian reggae music, I can get in there and maybe I could find some. But you won't find it coming down the mainstream, the main pipeline, because they're, they're shoveling product at you. That's all. They're just shoveling more of the same, you know. And they shovel it to younger and younger kids, Hannah Montana, the Jonas Brothers, because little kids have no idea what anything means. They just, everybody else likes it, so I like it. Because they're little kids, you know. I mean, you've got to be around a little while before you even have an opinion about music or some idea. Well, gee, I like music that, you know, is dark, and okay, or I like music that's happy, whatever. It takes a while to formulate your ideas, you know. So I think, I think the possibilities are there, and maybe the internet can open this up, and some, some of those, because I think we're all looking for good music. I'm looking for good music, and I got to go find it. And I think the internet helps, is, you know, it's a pathway to good stuff. Ja, 
Es ist begrenzt, glaube ich, die Möglichkeiten. Obwohl ich immer daran geglaubt habe, dass letztlich die Musik das schafft. So, ne? Und äh, die Marktmechanismen und äh, das, so, dieses, das ist alles so perfekt installiert heute, dass da, also um da wirklich reinzukommen, effektiv reinzukommen, musste an irgendeiner Stelle Federn lassen. So, ne? <lacht> Und äh, das ist mir bisher noch nicht gelungen. Also ich habe bisher noch nicht den Typen gefunden, wo ich sagen würde, ja, okay, der macht es besser als ich. Und ich bin auf der anderen Seite aber auch noch so relativ vogelfrei. Also ich stecke jetzt nicht in solchen Zwängen, in denen vielleicht äh, Glacia oder was weiß ich so. Ne? So was würde mir wahrscheinlich nicht passieren. Ne? Aber äh, zufrieden bin ich damit auch nicht.
only did we make things hard for ourselves, physically, technically, however you want to put it, but we were making things challenging and difficult and uncomfortable for the people who were experiencing it as well. We wanted to take people out of their comfort zone, and we wanted to take ourselves out of our comfort zone, because no great art ever comes from comfort. Rocky! The word industry and music, first of all, shouldn't go together. The, the words industry and profits should go together. The words music and creativity should go together. And these two seem to clash. Industry, profits, music, creativity. They're like two magnetic forces that repel each other. When will I, will I be famous? It would be an incredibly naive, I'd say even stupid person who thought that a good record gets where it is just by being a good record. It's not the case. The inducements that are made to ensure a record uh, becomes successful are, are like manifold, and I wouldn't like to, uh, you know, go on record as saying one, one particular thing or another. But obviously money changes hands. Obviously um, certain people who uh, have a are in, responsible for what ter, turns up on tele, pop TV programs, are given nice holidays in, in nice sunny places in order that those bands actually, you know, get filmed in those nice sunny places and that happens. Of course, like, a music paper is more likely uh, to be induced to give a band a cover if they can be offered that cover story in San Francisco rather than Scunthorpe. Uh, of course, uh, a record shop is likely to stock uh, a record and make sure that it gets more prominent display if for every record that's that shop sells they get two free to sell um, it's just like you know basic human greed you know I mean which is what the whole industry revolves around which is what like the whole pop business you know is about is greed and that that's the way it works um, but that's I don't think that's to say it's corrupt though because um, Corruption suggests something underhand, and it really isn't that underhand at all. It's so obvious that, you know, everybody does it and everybody knows about it. Ever get the feeling you've been cheated? Good night.